es imposible hablar de seguridad social en América Latina sin mencionar su nombre. Para mí es el, el intelectual cubano más prestigioso en, en el exilio en estos momentos. Su trabajo ha sido único, innovador. Eh, él ha llevado, digamos, el tema de la seguridad eh, social de América Latina a, a un debate global. No sé si quieres que empecemos eh, por el principio o... ¿Cuál es el principio? <risa> Bueno, mi padre, Rogelio, eh, nació en Guanabacoa. Él, eh, además que hizo la escuela elemental, y después eh, hizo una especie de, de cursillo para hacerse procurador, que era una especie de auxiliar de abogado, eh, que podía ir a los tribunales, etc., pero no, no, tenía, no tenía título. Pero era un hombre eh, autoeducado y y sabía muy bien lo que trabajaba. Lo consultaban incluso hasta los jueces a veces, pero no era abogado. Ah, mi madre era de regla, que había una rivalidad además de, de pelota entre los, el team de, de regla de Guanabacoa. Y era, eh, ella aprendió eh, piano. Entonces ella era una maestra de música en, en el preprimario. Eh, yo desde que nací estuvo en La Víbora. Eh, esa es un barrio eh, clase media. Pero la casa que nosotros vivíamos no era nuestra, o sea, era una casa arrendada, que además habían congelado los alquileres y lo que pagaba mi padre era una basura, que son 30 pesos al mes, una cosa así. Y vivimos, eh, yo viví en dos o tres casas, pero la, la última, ahí estuve desde que de, 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 tenía sentido de la razón hasta que me fui. Estaba en Concepción, o está en Concepción porque después la he visitado. Y después tuve que ir unos años a La Habana porque no, no daban las mismas clases, un colegio antiguo también en San Rafael, y hasta que después entré en la universidad. Yo terminé mi, mi carrera en la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad de La Habana en, en el año 1956. Y fue, eh, fueron unos años muy, muy difíciles porque estaba andando la revolución y, y la FEU, eh, las demostraciones en la calle y todo eso. Y es claro, el, la universidad se cerraba con mucha frecuencia. Y todo el mundo tenía miedo eh, de que se cerrara definitivamente como después ocurrió. Eh, entonces yo empecé a trabajar en la, en la tesis de grado. Eh, como un año antes de, la, de los exámenes. De manera que yo tenía mi, mi tesis lista cuando hice mi último examen y la presenté al otro día. Y nada más que salimos dos o tres. Y um, entonces yo, yo gané una beca uh, para estudiar en, en España de hecho laboral, que era lo, lo que más me interesaba. Y uh, me fui en el, en el, en el, en el, en el 56 y había especializaciones y te voy a hacer una, a contar una anécdota yo siempre pienso que el azar juega un papel fundamental en la vida es decir, tú no puedes predecir lo que va a ocurrir y yo estaba en un tranvía entonces la, la ciudad universitaria de Madrid tenía tranvías y me encontré con una boliviana a Carmen Delgadillo se llamaba que por cierto no era delgada y me dijo acabo de venir de la Organización Iberoamericana de Seguridad Social, que me he matriculado porque están dictando unos, unos cursos. ¿Y eso qué cosa es? Y entonces me explicó que ah, eso es lo que yo quiero hacer. Y me matriculé ahí en la UIS. Así que ese fue mi entrada al campo que ha sido fundamental en mi vida. Para mí fue un gran placer eh, poder haber conocido el académico, el profesional, eh, me salago porque para mí es realmente el investigador, el académico más destacado eh, 
más importante en el área de la seguridad social y la política social en América Latina y conocerlo y um, digamos tener sus consejos, uh, disfrutar de sus conocimientos, análisis, fue una gran ayuda y realmente no me ayudó solamente para el doctorado, sino para toda mi carrera profesional. Y eh, trabajaba con dos abogados y sabía muchísimo de una serie de cosas de derechos civiles. A mí no me interesaba para nada el derecho civil, para nada, porque siempre tuve esa cosa social en la cabeza. Y bueno, yo estaba ahí porque no tenía otra cosa. Además de eso, yo tenía una columna en el periódico El Mundo uh, eh, y eso en el periódico lo, lo intervinieron. Así que bueno, ahí eventualmente eh, hubo el conflicto con la Iglesia Católica. Uh -huh. eh, yo había sido miembro no de la, de, de, del grupo este de, de la Asociación Católica Universitaria, que era un grupo más bien conservador, sino una organización de, de, de estudiantes de la universidad que era mucho más abierta uh -huh. y, uh, y entonces eso fue otro, otro conflicto serio, eso fue otro conflicto y yo en definitiva decidirme, uh -huh. decidirme, no podía seguir allí, después vino la, la invasión de Playa Girón uh -huh. y ahí hubo amigos míos de la, de, de, de la iglesia que a uno lo mataron, a otros varios, pero un profesor mío de, la, de los escolares, que es el, el colegio que yo me eduqué, la primaria y la secundaria, lo que me tiene nueve años de prisión. Entonces fue, en un momento dado, yo no sabía si yo estaba en una lista. Así que, también por la experiencia previa que había tenido. O sea, y así que yo decidí, decidí irme y fue, una, fue otro, otro azar, otro azar. Y es que había un, un barco el marqués de Comillas, que se había dedicado a realizar tráfico negrero, porque lo que hacía es que iba a los países de, de, del Caribe de ahora inglesa y se llevaba a toda esa gente para trabajar en las minas del sur de Inglaterra. Uh -huh. Y es claro, como era un barco español, fue cuando hubo conflicto que Fidel sacó o, o presionó para que salieran, no sé, claro. 800 eh, religiosos no hacer, sí. uh -huh. y, y religiosos. Y entonces la, eh, la embajada española mandó un cable al barco para que desviara la ruta y pasara por La Habana. Y entonces yo eh, eh, conseguí a, a través de un, mi padrino que tenía muchos contactos, que me pagó bien, yo no tenía dólares, eh, un, una ir en el barco. Y yo estaba muy preocupado porque no sabía oh, si estaba en una lista y vi que la persona, el miliciano que estaba controlando la entrada de la gente era un ex alumno de, de los escolares, oh. que ahora era miliciano. Se lo conocía. Estaba preocupado. Entonces yo me quedé para el final y por suerte este hombre se fue y yo, el último que tuve en el barco fui yo. <risa> Ay, Dios. Y bueno, y me fui a España porque yo no tenía, yo no tenía contactos en los Estados Unidos, ninguno. Y me fui para allá. Tú sales de Cuba y tú tienes a ser de extra crítico de la situación. Hay mucha gente incluso que exagera esto como una especie de, de compensación o de defensa en el sentido de no voy a ser acusado de, de haber estado en Cuba y entonces me vuelvo al otro extremo. Fíjate tú el costo de la objetividad. Había un, un colega mío que estaba en la conferencia, Roberto Hernández, uh -huh. que escribimos cosas juntos al principio, y decía que nosotros éramos los jóvenes de izquierda, porque todos ellos eran más mayores que nosotros, los jóvenes de izquierda, porque tratábamos... De ser Ahora, yo leo las cosas que publicaron y yo me voy muy... ¿Cómo es posible? Pero fue un salto cualitativo en, en aquel momento porque me empecé a, a entender a los jóvenes de izquierda porque porque tratábamos de ser objetivos por eso con la relación el costo con la objetividad. político de la objetividad el costo político de la objetividad, de la objetividad. Sí. Uh -huh. porque es muy difícil en el tema de la economía sobre todo en el caso de Cuba donde tienes que jugar con datos que vienen de Cuba mantener la imparcialidad a Carmelo le gusta la, la, la controversia y la polémica, pero siempre a una altura.
donde él no ataca personalmente a sus contrincantes, donde siempre este, mantiene eh, ciertos, eh, digamos, elementos de, de diálogo, de cortesía, eh, y sobre todo basado en argumentos y en, y en fuentes de información confiable, estadística, sobre todo en su caso. ¿no? Pero que, 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 que siempre ha hecho un esfuerzo, y esto es muy importante cuando se trata de Cuba, especialmente cuando pensamos en un economista trabajando sobre Cuba en la, en la década del 70, por ejemplo, que hicieron un esfuerzo tan dedicado y tan sistemático, eh, casi hasta el cansancio, por ofrecer una visión lo más equilibrada, lo más objetiva, lo más sustentada empíricamente posible sobre las realidades de Cuba, en una época donde una buena parte de la producción intelectual sobre la isla, desde la isla o, de, o, o desde fuera de la isla, estaba más bien caracterizada por el ladrido y no por la búsqueda seria de, de, de información empírica. Él lo que hizo fue, el eslogan que había en Cuba, él lo, fue el único argumento que me dio contra todas las bases de datos que yo le estaba dando. Y aquí viene el problema, y es que la, si tú estás obsesionado ideológicamente con una cosa, Tú cierras los oídos porque tú solamente quieres oír lo que refuerza tu posición. Uh -huh. Es como una cosa religiosa, es decir, aquí hay una burbuja y entonces la gente está protegido. Se reforza su idea con uh -huh. lo que están oyendo. Y si viene alguien de afuera que quiere tratar lo más diplomáticamente eh, y con bases en datos y en argumentos, es rechazado. Yo puedo hasta cierto punto entender, pero lo que no puedo entender es que un académico no Exacto. escuche razones de peso porque lo, lo sigue la ideología. Yo me siento siempre como un maestro, no un profesor, sino como un maestro, tra tratar no solo de educar a los estudiantes, sino de educar a la población. Y entonces, a partir de entonces, yo me hice el propósito de tratar de publicar lo más posible en Cuba. Hay mucha gente que critica a Rafael. Yo veo un punto muy positivo en el hecho de que él abrió una publicación oficial a distintos puntos de vista. Quizás no llegue a, a entrar a la disidencia, que sería lo ideal, pero hay que darle su mérito, o sea, uh -huh. yo lo respeto. Uh -huh. Una de las satisfacciones más grandes que yo tengo en mi carrera es que yo me he dado cuenta que podía no solo influenciar la academia americana, sino influenciar primero en, en la Academia de Cuba y después ya en una, en una publicación que la gente pudiera leer. Uh -huh. Para mí fue eso muy importante. Pero ahí fue cuando yo demostré en ese libro de que había el mito del, del empleo pleno en una economía socialista era falso. Uh -huh. Y eso en el año 68, te uh -huh. fijas que hasta el 2010 que, que Raúl acepta que hay ese problema. Uh -huh. Lo que se me ocurrió hacer un un gran uh, programa sobre el, el, prim el primer diseño de la revolución. Y fue un trabajo muy serio porque yo lo que hice fue editar los, los trabajos, no simplemente hacerle unas pequeñas cosas con él. Y ese fue el primer libro que salió en los Estados Unidos de Revolución, Revolución, Revolution Change in Cuba. Uh, Policy, Economy and Society. Uh -huh. uh, Economía, Política y Sociedad. Esa ese carácter inicial de, de algo multidisciplinario fue lo que, digamos, fijó el estilo de, de un programa de estudios sobre Cuba, que no fuera exclusivamente política o economía, sino que fuera en, diferente, en diferentes disciplinas. Y ahí empezó eh, esa cosa que se llamaba Boletín de Estudios sobre Cuba, que se, era bilingüe, después se convirtió en la revista Estudios Cubanos, que un estudio, y por último se hizo el anuario, que ahora es bilingüe, ¿no? Uh, uh, Cuban Studies. Y eso yo lo dirigí eh, los primeros 18 años. Siempre con un criterio de multidisciplinar. Así que para mí fue una sorpresa y una alegría tremenda cuando me llamaron por teléfono para decirme que me, me van a dar el premio. Y además me dicen que, que lo voy a compartir con Nelson Mandela, que si ya es lo la cúspide, ¿no? Yo diría que otra parte muy bonita de la vida de Carmelo es que él siempre ha tenido a Elena al lado y, y ella ha ido con él a todas partes y tienen una relación realmente muy, 
ella lo apoya mucho y tú sabes, él realmente ha sido, han sido una pareja muy bonita. Y él ha nacido para mí, no hay ninguna persona que sea tan importante en mi vida como ella, realmente. Constantemente se lo agradezco, porque sin ella yo no hubiera podido hacer lo que yo soy. Y como ves, ella rehúsa. Y ya se lo he dicho, tú tienes que estar en esta comunidad. Es muy importante que tú sabes esto. Yo, en todos los lados que yo voy, que me hagan un homenaje, yo siempre me refiero a ella lo importante que ella es para mí. Y con los, nuestros hijos, estas hijas, que son tres, ha sido algo increíble, realmente. Yo no podía hacer lo que soy sin ella. Good evening, I'm Iraidi Turralde. First and foremost, I would like to thank Elena Costa and Carlos Diaz for letting us include in this homage the brief segment of their documentary that we have just seen. Their film not only gives us an all-encompassing profile of Carmelo, but it reflects his human dimension as well. We would have wanted to celebrate this occasion at Instituto Cervantes, but we are broadcasting it through this channel with the same sense of duty and pride. On behalf of the Cuban Cultural Center of New York, I am very happy to pay tribute to Cuban economist Carmelo Mesa Lago. In honor of his long and admirable career, his exceptional contribution to the field of social security, and his great legacy to the national patrimony of Cuba. As evidence of this tribute, we award him the plaque of recognition that you now see on the screen. And now I take great pleasure in introducing Carmelo, who will be discussing the Cuban economy, its current crisis, and its outlook for its future. I'm very grateful to the Cuban Cultural Center of New York for this plaque that you've given to me. It's a great honor. Thank you so much. And thanks also to the Cervantes Institute for having sponsored this event. Here you have the subject of my presentation. I'm going to talk about the Cuban economy. I'm going to describe what the current crisis consists of. Here you have the summary. This is the worst crisis that Cuba has suffered since the 90s after the special period in times of peace after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And what we're going to try to do is first describe the current crisis. And we're going to do this based on a series of key indicators. These have all been taken from official statistics from the National Office of Statistics and Information of Cuba. I've studied these statistics over many years and some of them are problematic but most of them are acceptable afterwards we're going to analyze the four principal causes of the crisis the continuation of a central planning model that has failed the world over and raul castro's reforms tried to changed that situation, the structural reforms law, but it didn't turn out that way. They didn't improve the economy, and we'll briefly see what happened later. The second cause is the major drop in economic aid from Venezuela. The third is the effects of the Trump sanctions. And the last is the economic impact of the pandemic. And later, we'll look at some options for the future. This is the first graph up till 2019. These are all official Cuban statistics. 
you can see this started in 2006. In August of that year, Raul Castro took over the government temporarily because of Fidel Castro's illness. And after the reforms began in 2007, and he was reaffirmed in that position uh, later on a permanent basis. This is the gross domestic product, which is the total values of goods and services throughout the economy. It There was a brief uptick in 2015, which to a large extent was due to Obama's normalization process and the increase in tourism. This later dropped, and these figures for 2020, that's the official projection made by the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, which is about 3.7%. There's another projection by the Economist Intelligence Unit, and they project a much greater decrease of 8.3%. If we take the years from 2016 through 2019, before this steep decline, the average growth average was 1.2%, which is pretty much stale growth. If we add the projections for this year, the average from 2016 to 2020 would be 0.3%. And we believe, and later we'll see, that the ECLAC figures are very optimistic. The economist figures are much more pessimistic. They predict a larger decline. The second indicator we're going to use, actually we're going to use two. The first is the blue line, which is gross capital formation. This is investment, we could say this, because if there's a greater accumulation of capital with respect to the GDP, there's a greater possibility of the economy growing. And we can see that in 2008, it grew to 14.8%, and this dropped through 2014 at 76 and increased up to 12%. If we take these last five years from 2014 through 2018, the average is below 10%, 9.7%. Now, if we compare this with the accumulation of capital in 1989, which was right before the crisis of the special period, that was 25%. So what we have over the last year for which there are figures, because 2019 figures won't come out to the end of uh, this year, October, November of this year. This is less than what Cuba had in 1989. And Cuba has never uh, come close to that percentage of the GDP. They set as the percentage they should achieve 25%. But since 1989, they've never come close. And this is the second indicator, which as you can see here, is in red. And it's the um, fiscal deficit. This means that uh, revenue has been systematically lower than expenditures, which has led to a deficit. It was pretty low here, 1.3 in 2013, and this rose to 8%. So you can have a basis for comparison, the average for all of Latin America and the Caribbean in 2018, according to ECLAC, was 2.2%. So Cuba had four times the average of the ECLAC average. And by the way, I forgot that with respect to the blue curve, 12% uh, in 2018, and for Latin America and the Caribbean, it was 18%, 0.6%. But the average for these five years was 19.6 and Cuba had 9.7, so it was half. So now we're going to look at two other indicators. The first in red is the inflation rate. We have some problems with this indicator because of some, for some reasons, uh, 
I told you I've studied the statistics for very uh, various years, and this one is not reliable. Cuba centrally determines prices which are not determined by supply and demand. There are two currencies in Cuba, the convertible currency and the national uh, peso. And this calculation of inflation or the consumer price index was done only by taking into account the uh, national peso. But it turns out that Cubans have to use the convertible peso to buy many things in dollars that are denominated in dollars or euros. So if they don't use the convertible peso and just the national peso, the this index is underused. And furthermore, there's another problem, which is that Cuba has never published the basket of goods and services they use to calculate inflation. That is to say, the consumer price index. That is to say, this index has a lot of problems. You can see uh, there are points where there are deflation. Uh, 1995, 2000, and 2016. So here I have another indicator which I believe is more reliable, which is the excess of circulating currency. When there's a lot of circulating currency, that is an indicator of inflationary pressure. There's a lot of money, but not products to buy. And here you have the peak. This was the, in terms of the GDP, the height was in 1993, the worst year in the major crisis of the 90s. And it was 73% of the GDP. And then it dropped. And then you see that it increased in 2004, and it reached practically 59% in 2018. And this is the highest rate reached compared in comparison with that worst peak of 73% into 1990 and 91.7% in 1994. Here we see a different uh, evolution. Here it's dropping or is flat. And here, on the other hand, it's growing. And this indicator is much more revealing with respect to inflation, which has been suppressed in Cuba for the reasons I've explained. These, this is a very important indicator. This is the index of industrial production. Here we have all types of manufacturing, industry, construction, etc., and it's based on 1989. 1989 is equivalent to 100. Now, look and observe that in 1993, which was the worst year in the crisis, as I explained before, that dropped to 39%. In other words, it drive, dropped 61% over 1989. Starting in 2003, it started to increase, and it reached 67.6% in 2018. So there is a partial recovery, but if you compare the 100% of 1989, and you subtract 67.6%, you'll get a drop of practically 33 percentage points. That explains what many Cuban economists have referred to a decapitalization of industry in Cuba. This, in, this is a, a general indis, index, as I said, but if you look just at sugar, which is the principal product or nickel sugar between 1989 and 2018, that index dropped 82%, not 33%, the general index, but 82%. Here, there's some other indicators. Agricultural production is quite important, and this is in constant prices because that eliminates inflation. We have that in 2007, it increased 7.3% with Raul's reforms. But afterwards, in 2017, it dropped. It was negative. It dropped 1.5%. Another thing I've done is to take the 13 leading agricultural and livestock products between 2007 and 2018. And over that period of time, the production of 11 of those products was below the peak, which was reached during that 11-year period. But even more revealing is if we seven of those products were below the 1989 levels. So after all those years, 
since the period of special uh, the special period beginning production levels were below that of 1989 as a result of this poor performance agricultural exports dropped practically 50% since 2012. On the other hand, Cuba had to import $1.9 billion in agricultural products in 2018. And this has been a constant over the last eight or nine years between uh, $1.9 billion and $2 billion annually in agricultural production, which Cuba could produce itself but has to import. The other important factor is mining production, which dropped to an average rate of minus 2.3% over that period. It was negative throughout the entire time. And we, if we do the same thing with mining and manufacturing that we did with agriculture, we take the th 11 most important manufacturing and mining lines between 2007 and 2018, we see that out of those 11 lines, 10 were below the high point for the period, and most were below the 1989 level. There were various products that were below, all seven of those products were below the 1989 levels. You can see how the in, in industrial production dropped and how it was still 31 percent uh, below the 1989 high. Because of this poor economic performance, Cuba's exports have dropped 50 percent, and that led to a systematic deficit in the trade balance for goods. That means that the imports of goods is higher than the exports, and that creates a deficit. So in 2018, the exports of goods were practically 50% below their 1989 level after more than 20 years. Imagine what that means. While imports were 41% above the 1989 levels. So a deficit was produced in the trade balance for goods, and that increased 220% between 1989 and 2018. And the last data point here is last year, Cuba had to pay $80 million. Uh, Cuba has a debt with the Club of Paris. There are 14 countries there. Cuba owned, owed them $11 billion, and the club pardoned about $8 billion of that. So Cuba had to pay $2.6 billion, and it had to pay an annual amount. And the second payment for last year, $33 million, was impossible because of Cuba's crisis. And that means that the Club of Paris can impose a 9% annual interest rate until it makes the payment. Okay. Here we have tourism in Cuba, which is the third source of foreign currency. The first is the export of professional services, mainly medical services in Venezuela, which we'll see in a minute. The second are the remittances, which we will see after this. And the third source is tourism. And here we have some blue bars and we have some red bars. The blue bars are what we call gross tourism income. We don't subtract the costs of the tourist industry to provide food and drink to the tourists, which have to be imported. And uh, so if we subtract the imports, you can see the red bars. That's what Cuba actually receives, which is much less than the gross income for tourism. So you can see that although there are fluctuations, those bl blue bars and also the red bars reached their peak in 2017. And there's an acceleration from 2015 to 2017 because of the increase in tourism under Obama, where he uh, flexibilized trips to Cuba and 
cruise ships. And then there were the Trump measures. And you can see that the drop from 3,185 goes to 2,903. And then here we have the Trump sanctions. It goes to 2,633. And in the pandemic starts, Cuba is closed off to tourism and it drops to 1.1 billion. If we use the gross income, but if we use the net income, it's only 462 million. So if we use the uh, gross tourist income from 2018 to 2020, this is an estimate that I did for 2020 of $1.8 billion. And this income, uh, and this curve shows the number of tourists generally. And we see that it reached two, that started at 2000, uh, 2.5 billion, and it reached its peak in 2018 with at 4.7 billion, and it dropped to 1.79 billion in 2018. And here we have remittances. As I was saying, remittances are the second most important source of foreign currency for Cuba. I should say that these are only cash remittances. There is a Cuban economist, Emilio Morales from whom I borrowed these figures, except for the 2020 figure, which is a projection of mine. And he calculates a similar amount in remittances for food and goods, which would mean that this is actually twice as high, but we only wanted to use the cash remittances for this purpose. And we see that they systematically increase the, um, from, uh, it reaches, 3.7 billion in uh, 2019. From 2018 to 2019, there's not much of a difference. But afterwards, this dropped precipitously to 2020 uh, because of a combination of Trump's measures and the coronavirus. Because when the trips to Cuba were uh, shut down, the mules who would carry cash for friends and relatives and also for purposes of exchange stopped. And the loss in this sense was $1.8 billion in 2020. Of course, afterwards, we don't know what's going to happen in 2021. If we add the loss of $1.8 billion for remittances with the $1.3 billion in losses, which we saw in the prior slides here, for tourism, we have $3.1 billion. That mean, that's equivalent to 5% of Cuba's GDP for 2019. So the ECLA uh, figure predicting a drop of 3.6% is impossible because these are just two um, categories. And if we don't take, without taking into consideration the export of professional services. So we can see that the ECLA figures is overly optimistic. Now let's look at the, we said there were four causes of the crisis. And the, this is the first, the persistence of an economic model with a predomination of the central planning over the market. There are only two countries in the world, two socialist countries that continue with centralized planning, Cuba and North Korea, because China and Vietnam don't have centralized planning. They have a decentralized planning system, which is a sort of guideline, not a straight jacket, as is the case in Korea, North Korea and Cuba. Furthermore, there is a predomination of the state uh, business over the uh, private sector, and that's very inefficient. The non-state sector plays a very important role in the economies of China and North, and um, uh, Vietnam. Here we have the independent contractors, and here we have the use of fruct, which is where the state gives idle land to farmers. The Farmers don't own the land. That is reserved to the state, but they can produce on the land and they can keep the fruits of their labor, but they have to sell a percentage of their harvest up to 70% to the state. And the state sets a price which is below the market price. 
below what market um, much off supply and demand would uh, set. It's like a t sort of ta tax, and it's an enormous disincentive for agricultural production, which explains the drop we showed before in figures. Independent contractors is a proportion, uh, 33 percent, and of that, the the self-employed sector, which is the only pride, private sector along with farmers, we're talking about 18 or 19 percent. Here we have the labor force between 2007 and 2018, and on the, the blue line is the percentage of the state sector as a part of the total labor force. And you can see that starting in 2010, when Raul's reforms uh, started, that dropped from 84% to 77%. And uh, over the total period of time, 82% to 68%, 15% drop. The non-state sector went from 17% to 31.6%. So it increased 15 percentage points. That is positive. The problem is that the non-state sector and the private sector expanded, but did not expand enough. Why do I say this? Because in two th 2011, Raul Castro said there were 1.1 million excess unnecessary workers. That led to a drop in productivity and salaries. And the problem, this is a problem that Cuba was facing since before the crisis of the 90s. And this non-state sector had to be extended much more. And that was not the case. Instead of firing 1.8 excess million excess workers, um, 1.3 million workers continued in the state sector. And that was still inefficient. The second cause of the crisis, as I explained, was the terrible crisis that, that Venezuela experienced. Worse than the Great Depression, the worst in Latin America, the inflation in Venezuela is the worst in the entire world. And Venezuela had a, a relationship, it still does, but not the relationship it had before, and a very important economic relationship with Cuba. This is a work, uh, is a paper that I worked on with Paul Vidal, a Cuban economist, and it's based on billions of dollars. The red line is the sum of all the com other components of that relationship I'm going to explain. You can see that in 2012, it's the height of this economic relationship. 16 billion dollars. $16 billion. And this was reduced to half, dropped by 50% by 2017. Now, what's included in this total relationship? The green line is the most important. This is the most important income from economic services, uh, the, the export of professional services. The height was $8.3 billion, and it dropped to $5.8 billion, a drop of 24%. This was an enormous drop. Many of these doctors who were being whose services were paid for went back to Cuba or went to other countries. The blue or purple line is the shipment of oil by Venezuela to Cuba. And you can see that the height of this was in 2012, $6 billion, and that dropped to $1.8 billion. This was an, that's a drop of 70%. To put it in other terms, in 2012, Venezuela was exporting 140,000 barrels of oil a day. Last year, that dropped to 40,000 barrels of oil a day. And the blue line, 
is the is non-oil trade and that dropped 86 percent now i want to present this in simpler terms this is the value of the economic relationship of venezuela with cuba measured as a percentage of the cuban gdp at its height in 2012 this means that 22 percent of cuba's gdp was generated by the total economic relationship with uh, Venezuela. This is a historical dependence uh, situation that uh, Cuba had with uh, Spain and the United States, the Soviet Union, and later Venezuela. And you can see that it dropped from 22% to 8%. It dropped 14 percentage points. That's the enormous drop that uh, took place and the enormous impact it had economically. Now we'll look at the second, the, I'm sorry, the third cause, which is the impact of the Trump sanctions on the Cuban economy. First of all, we have the application of Title III of the Helms-Burton Act, which was the law of the embargo in Cuba. It's called the blockade. And that had been suspended from 1996 under Clinton, which is when the Congress approved the law of the embargo and this, the Embargo Act. This clause allows all people who owned assets confiscated by the Cuban government to start lawsuits in U.S. courts to recover those assets. That caused problems with uh, Canada and Europe. So the Clinton uh, administration and all the other successive administrations, including the first 18 months of the Trump administration, suspended this clause for three, for six months. But last year, Trump, for the first time, executed that clause. And so it's calculated there are $8 billion in certified claims, demonstrated claims, but in addition, there are thousands of uncertified claims for billions of dollars. The fundamental impact of this was a freezing of new investment. There are parts of investment that never worked out, but that's not the most important element. The most important thing is that all the new investment was paralyzed. Keep in mind that Cuba's goal was to have $2.5 billion in new foreign investment annually. And we're not talking about agreements. We're talking about things that have, contracts have actually started to function in Cuba. And in the spec, special Mariel sector, we're talking about uh, $500 million a year. And it's a fifth. And... And that's not going to come about because of the application of Title III. U.S.-based tourism dropped 22% in 2019, 66% in January and February, probably was shut off in March. And that was because of Trump's prohibition of ocean cruises and the prohibition of flights to provinces outside of Havana. American tourists were not allowed to um, eat in restaurants or stay at hotels that were run by the military sector. And I calculate the cost of this in at $1 billion. And then there was the reinforcement of sanctions against international banks doing business with Cuba. This was done before, but what Trump did was to reinforce this. There, he imposed sanctions of $12 billion on a series of foreign banks. Cuba can't conduct foreign op uh, operations and does not have access to international credit. The fourth measure was to try to prevent oil supplies from Venezuela reaching Cuba. Venezuela resorted to a series of tricks to avoid this. But this has had a certain impact, not as much as was hoped, but it has had some ex uh, effect. And you can see this in the curve that I showed you before. You recall that there was a curve for oil supplies. Part of that is because of Venezuela's crisis, and part of that is because of Trump's measures. And this has had 
a negative internal impact on production, uh, factories, hotels, agriculture. And the fifth measure imposed by Trump, an annual um, maximum limit of $4,000 annually per person in remittances. The average remittances Cubans receive is 3000 3,833, so it's less than the 4,000. But the issue is that two weeks ago, the military company in Cuba that acted as the intermediary for West Union, which sends all the remittances in Cuba, which is the second largest source of income, the Trump government put that company on the list of prohibited Cuban companies. They said, you've got to change this military company, otherwise remittances will not be received. It's not known what's gonna be done in Cuba, but there's enormous concern on the island because 65% of the population receives remittances and that could produce an awful situation. I predicted in earlier papers, it's very difficult to make predictions on Cuba. You have to be very careful. I had predicted that this crisis is the worst if the nine, worse than the 90s, but it's not going to have the same impact as in the 90s because there are greater variety of trading partners, greater variety in investment. Cuba receives uh, income for uh, exports of professional services and tourism and remittances that it didn't receive earlier, and that's positive. That led me to think that the crisis would not be of the same magnitude, but the combination of the crisis in Venezuela, the Trump sanctions, and the pandemic is affecting all of that. It's affecting remittances, it's affecting the exports of professional services and tourism. So uh, increasingly, it seems, and there are some leaders and Cuban economists who say we are approaching a situation similar to the special period. Vidal says it's the special period without the blackouts. So the situation is increasingly getting worse. I've made an analysis. Neither Russia, Russia or China can completely replace Venezuela. It's impossible to do this under the current situation. Russia is going to have a drop in its GDP. China had a drop in the first quarter. It's going to be positive for the entire union, but it's going to be the lowest in 44 years. There's no way that they can completely replace Venezuelan aid. An indication of this was just published by Reuters. China reduced its imports from Cuba in the first quarter by 55%. And now we have the pandemic. It's very interesting because Cuba at the outset engaged in propaganda and said, we are a safe tourist destination. Come, we don't have any problems. And they delayed in applying the measures. And afterwards, since it's an authoritarian government, a centralized government with a health sector, which is quite controlled. They applied a series of measures and we have to see what's gonna happen with the reopening, but it, it seems that they have done adequate work, although the figures are not that believable. They withheld the measures until 20th of March, 10 days after the proclamation of the pandemic by the World Health Organization. And the closure of ports and airports in terms of tourism was April 2nd. This also stopped, as I said to you before, the sending of remittances by mules, those people who send money or assets um, to as gifts or to sell. Uh, Cuba announced reopening for tourism on the 30th of June, but the but now it's the U.S. Has said there will be no flights until August 1st. So April, May, June, July, August. So that we're talking about five or six months where there was no tourism in Cuba. So that's why I calculated practically two billion dollars of losses for tourism. You have the first effect here. $1.8 billion in tourism plus $1.3 billion in remittances. That comes to 5% of the Cuban GDP that I mentioned before. The foreign investment in Cuba was frozen. The government 
announced there'll be a greater drop in imports. They don't have resources. They can't pay for their foreign debt. There is, they, they can't pay for food. There is enormous scarcity of food that has also affected agricultural production internally. And there's going to be a greater uh, drop in imports because, or exports because nickel production is going to drop sugar production is going to drop it is calculated the harvest will be 1.4 million tons in cuba in the 80s produce more than 8 million tons and and this will be con wiped out by internal consumption and 400 million that have to be exported to china and in terms of medicine production stopped to drop in 2006, and then Cuba stopped publishing the figures, which to me means that the production of medicine has continued to drop, and Cuba doesn't have resources to finance a rescue package. It can't turn to international financial uh, mechanisms such as the IMF, the IDB, and the World Bank, because it's not members of those institutions and it's impossible for that to happen under Trump. And the only positive thing is the export of doctors in the pandemic. Cuba says it sent doctors to 14 countries, but the amounts we're talking about, 600 to Mexico, to Argentina, 75 to Italy, but without counting Venezuela, between Brazil, Ecuador, Bolivia, and El Salvador, Cuba lost $9,000. And it can't make up for that figure with what it's now sending in uh, under the pandemic. So the net, the law, the net effect here was negative. And now we'll discuss future options. I published two or three papers on this, and it's impossible in one slide to explain it all, but just so you can have a general overview, the government does not have a comprehensive, innovative strategy to take on the crisis. More than 10 Cuban economists have said this. I've some, published a paper summarizing the opinions of the Cuban eco economist on the Cuban economic policy. And they say, this is not going to solve the problem. There's nothing new here. Now, there are various alternatives. Many people ideally say, well, Cuba could make a transition similar to what happened in East Europe towards market economies. Frankly, I think this is difficult in Cuba. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think the chances of this happening are low. Most academic e economists, and I know them, and I have, I have relationships with them, I publish with them, say, we hope that for a mixed economy, there will be a balanced relationship between the state, the market, and the private sector. What they don't agree on is what is the degree of state participation versus the private sector. There's no agreement on that. It's very difficult. For me, it would be more viable to adopt the China-Vietnamese avenue of market socialism. In Vietnam and China, the private sector and the market are the two most dyna dynamic elements of economic growth. These countries' economic growth was among the highest in the world, and it should start with agriculture, which is where, which could be the source not only of a recovery from the crisis, but for a stable economy, because these countries began with agriculture. They had an enormous deficit. There were periodic famines, and then they later became self-sufficient Vietnam exports. It's one of the major rice exports, exporters of Cuba, of rice in the world. It it's exports to Cuba 250,000 units of rice, which Cuba could export if it had the right conditions. And the past leaders like Fidel and current leaders like uh, Raul and Diaz-Canel say, this model isn't for us. 
because we have different characteristics. I don't believe that. Vietnam, for example, had an embargo, just as Cuba had and does have, and it was able to move ahead with that model. These are some of the proposals from Cuban economists. I have other papers summarizing what they have put forth. I'm now finishing a 50-page paper devoted to the proposals. It's very difficult to summarize them, but let me give you an idea. There's no doubt about this. Everybody, the government, the academic economists say there has to be monetary union and a union of the exchange rates. There are different exchange rates for the dollar and the euro. The problem that this has is that monetary union, structural reform, much more profound than Raoul's, could not work because there would be enormous inflation. Salaries would have to increase. There has to be an increase in production and internal supply for monetary union to work. And that's where the problem lies. There's a great debate in Cuba among the major economists, some like Berto Perez, who was the minister of the centralized planning system. The second is a comprehensive reform of prices and salaries. Uh, Cuba reformed its salaries 37% for the non-business sector, that is social services and all those things. But even so, if you adjust this for inflation, the salary in 2019 was 40% below. Uh, the purchasing power was 40% less than in 1989. If there is a devaluation, what's going to be eliminated and with the convertible peso, you'll have the national peso, but that national peso would have to be devalued. And if it's devaluated, it devalued, it loses value. And so there'll be inflation. They also propose the elimination of various barriers. There's like five or six states on the non-state sector, four or five taxes on the non-state sector. There's one called the tax on the labor force where um, independent contractors have to pay a tax with an increasing level depending on the number of employees they hire, which is absurd because Cuba needs to create jobs. I just mentioned there are more than a million workers in the state sector who are unnecessary and have to be moved into the non-state private sector. And people who want to create work are being punished. It's totally absurd. The first thing they should get rid of is that. Well, professionals can't work in their profession freelance. A doctor cannot work freelance as a doctor. He can be a taxi driver. He can have a rust restaurant. Architects can't work as architects freelance. That's a problem because today, well, now construction is stopped. But last year, the greatest number of houses were built in the private sector and they needed architects because an architect but an architect legally can't work in the private sector. He might do this informally under the table, but this should be resolved. It's absurd. Uh, also, there's a recommendation to expand the number of private activities. There are some urban cooperatives that Raul created. We're talking five or six years ago. Non- um, non-agricultural service cooperatives, but they're in this experimental phase and they've been in that state for five, six or seven years. We held some interviews in 2015 and they were saying to us, how long do we have to wait for the experimental phase to end? And the government alleges that there are deviations, that things that haven't worked well. Well, they should increase that because right now there, there are only 18,000 workers in this sector out of a labor force of more than 4 million. That's nothing. Accumulation has to be ended. The idea of accumulation is that all agriculture um, farmers, whether they are state or cooperative workers or use of fructuaries, have to send most of their harvest to the state at 
state set prices, and that's an enormous disincentive. This has to be ended. This is one of the uh, crucial changes made in China and Vietnam. Allow the farmer to decide what I am going to sow, who I'm going to sell to, and I will set the prices. Not me, the market, supply and demand. Though that measure in and of itself, they, they wouldn't have to worry about Trump or the world um, monetary, for the IMF. Uh, Vietnam did that under the embargo. It would change Cuba's panorama in five or six years. It would be self-sufficient in food if Cuba did that. Micro businesses should be able to freely associate, negotiate with the government, be able to export and import directly. There's a lack of micro loans in Cuba. This is a problem of developing countries. There is no bank. That, there's You don't have a well-organized independent bank that can provide micro loans to the non-state sector. One of the problems that a, a survey I conducted with some Cuban sociologists was that the principal concern of the non-state sector is where do we get the inputs, what we need to be able to work. If it's a restaurant, we're talking about food and drink, etc. Those wholesale markets need to be created. And there are some, there's a survey which is conducted every three months among foreign businessmen. And the first thing they uh, criticize in the foreign investment law in Cuba is that they can't directly hire and fire their workers, fire them if they steal, for example. They have to go through an intermediary, which is the state, and the state gets its cut, and workers are paid a pittance. That has to be changed. And lastly, it is calculated that the capital of Cuban Americans I'm not talking about uh, Mexico, Spain, and other countries, but just in the U.S., ranges between $40 um, billion and $50 billion. China and Vietnam attracted those expatriates, and they became investors in China and Vietnam. And Cuba says, the government says, you can do that, nothing stops that, but it's not clear even for micro businessmen, small businessmen, whether the money they receive from remittances can be invested. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much for your participation or attendance. And now we will open a question and answer session. Thank you very much.